I'm recording this video at the end of 2022 and uh, it's going to be released very, very close to the New Year uh, holiday. And I therefore thought it might make sense to go back to some of the videos that I did earlier this year and kind of add a couple of comments because there were a couple of developments. Some developers actually kind of reached out to me and implemented a couple of things that I talked about. And I also want to talk a little bit about what I did in terms of my hearing loss and how I actually deal with that. So we're going to talk about Dolby Atmos, we're going to talk about Nuendo, and we're going to talk a little bit about hearing loss and that's essentially what we're going to do today. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design and spatial audio. And if any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. Invite link is in the description below. And since you're already added, also please don't forget to press the like button, especially if you get any value out of my videos. It really helps out the channel and it makes these videos more visible to other people. Thank you. So the way I'm going to do this today is very similar to the way I always do things. So we're going to start with a very simple uh, project and I'm going to work with uh, Nuendo today and I'm going to work on a Mac today. And I have three tracks, uh, three very, very simple loops. And if you have been watching my videos for quite some time, you are familiar with those loops. Those are the loops that we used in the game audio course. So let's just uh, have a brief listen on how that sounds. So once we have a, a synth, uh, a pad, and then essentially some keys are coming in. So let's first turn that into Adobe Atmos project. So there are two things we need to do. Well, there are a couple of things we need to do, but the first thing we need to do is we need to add a bed track and a uh, bus track. So let's first add the bed track and the bed track is a 7.1.2. So let's call that the bed. And uh, then let's add another track and let's call that the bus track. And that has to be a 7.1.4. Let's add that one. And then let's do a, a little bit of routing. Uh, so uh, the uh, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to route the synth, the keys, and the pad track into the pad. And we need to do that so that the uh, channel panel becomes the immersive panel because otherwise uh, Nuendo doesn't know that it can route those tracks into the Dolby Atmos renderer. So I'm going to do that. So let's uh, route that into the pad. And let's do the same thing for the other two. So we have, we have the keys. It's going to go into the bed. And the last one. And that's going to be in the bed as well. And then we are going to also route the bed. And the bed we're going to route into the Dolby Atmos bus. So let's that into the bus and then we have essentially everything set up uh, as always once i've done that i should actually hear everything the, in exactly the same way it was before all we really did is we routed things around and everything works as expected so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add the dolby atmos renderer to the dolby atmos bus so here in the inserts we're going to add the dolby uh dolby renderer Renderer for Dolby Atmos, uh, it's going to pop up. The next thing we need to do is we need to set up in the project settings uh, the ADM authoring. So um, that essentially makes sure that everything is set up correctly. So let's choose the, the renderer for Dolby Atmos. And then we're going to add a bed. And the bed is going to be the bed track here. And then we're going to add two objects. Uh, and these objects are going to be the uh, the keys and the synth. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the pad as uh, a track that we're going to route into the pad directly. So now if I've set that up, so let me just uh, double check if everything still works. So uh, by now I should actually hear something uh, coming through the Dolby Atmos renderer. So let's just open up the... Dolby Atmos renderer. I see the the four objects, uh, objects 11 to 14. Those are the two stereo tracks. And I see the bad channel that essentially comes in as a 7.1.4 bad track. So let's just do that. So we have the, here we have the, the two objects, the two stereo objects, and then we have the pad which goes into the, the pad. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to move the, uh, the the synth and the keys a little bit around so that we get a little bit of spatial uh, spatial impression. So let's move that maybe. I'm not going to kind of uh, bother too much. So let's just move them here a bit. So that 
just so that we have more action going on on all individual channels. And then we're going to do the same thing for the keys. Oops, sorry. So let's let's move them to the back maybe. Let's bring them in and move them up a little. So that we have essentially really action going on everywhere. Now the way I'm going to work with the Atmos bed is a little bit different today. Uh, what I'm going to do is instead of routing the pad into the bed directly, I'm going to actually use an additional helper track. So I'm going to upmix it first and then essentially route that upmixed signal into the bed. The reason I'm going to do that will become apparent a little bit later because I want to demonstrate the capabilities of one particular plugin. So let's uh, let's just do that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a group track and the group track that I'm going to do is a 7.1 and let's call that helper. And let's add that one. And then I'm going to route the pad into the helper track. And then essentially the helper track, I'm going to route that into the bed, right? So here we are. So let's just uh, listen if, if, if I didn't change anything. No, still everything fine. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually do some upmixing in this helper track. So let's just open the uh, helper track here and let's add an upmix plugin. And the one I'm going to use is Halo Upmix from NewGen. I, I really like that one. Um, very straightforward to use. And it's going to upmix everything into a 7.1 track. So let's see if that actually does what it's supposed to do. So as you can see, it's taking the signal and it's upmixing it so that we actually have information on at least the eight, the first eight channels in the bed. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is a plugin that I actually did a review earlier this year, and that was Hornet Sump. And Hornet Sump, uh, if you remember, and I'm, once again, I'm going to post links to, the, to these videos in the description below, but Hornet Sump was meant to replace a uh, the, it's sort of the mastering channel, because in Atmos, we don't really have a b ability to do any mastering. There is no mastering channel. It's essentially the, the mix is mixed on the fly in the renderer, so essentially meant to be created during the actual rendering in the consumer endpoint device. And so but there isn't really any mastering step. And what it Hornet Sump has done is essentially create a plugin that replaces that. And the way it functions is actually very straightforward. It, it kind of, you put it on each individual object, and then essentially you have one plugin that controls, uh, you know, kind of the EQ, the compression, the limiting on all individual objects simultaneously. And the one thing that uh, didn't work when I did the review was the fact that uh, it couldn't actually work on the bed. So you could only use it on the objects, and that to me at least was a disadvantage. Now, Hornet has since, uh, Hornet has actually reached out to me uh, shortly after that, and they kind of, uh, we, we got into a discussion of what they should actually add, and they did add the functionality uh, in, in terms of kind of adding the possibility to uh, also put that plugin onto a bed. So let's just do that. So let's see if everything works the way it's supposed to. Um, so let me go back to this little project here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, well, first of all, let, let's add the um, plugin onto our object. So let's add a stamp plugin here. Uh, here we are. So that's the first one. And uh, we now have it on the keys. Let's also put one on the synth. So let's add that as here as well, Samp. Uh, okay. And the idea obviously is that uh, uh, if we if we now play the sound, right, I can essentially add an EQ that affects all objects simultaneously. Now what it didn't do, it didn't really affect the bed. So when I added a bed, it would actually only kind of affect the first two channels, but not all individual channels simultaneously. So let's see if that has actually changed. So let's open up the, the, the bed actually. So let's, we need to open up the helper track and let's, uh, sorry, we need to open up the bed track. And let's put the, um, let's put the plugin onto the bed track as well. So let's, let's put that on here. 
And the first thing that you can see is when we did the original review, whenever I put a new instance onto the onto the set, it would automatically kind of uh, collapse <laughs> everything that already set back. This is no longer the case. So if you add an additional instance, it actually remembers the settings. Uh, and uh, we already kind of coming in with this uh, EQ setting that we just did in, in uh, one of the other instances. And let's just uh, listen if uh, the EQ now has an effect of on all individual um, channels in the bed track. Now the easiest way to really see that is by just kind of changing the output channel. So if I'm now changing and let me just close that here, we don't need that one. And we also don't really need that one. So if I'm, if I'm now changing the output signal, it actually decreases all of the tracks and uh, that essentially means the EQ is now operating on all eight channels and you can now use the SAMP plugin in exactly the way it is intended to be used as a, as a, as a replacement of a mastering channel where you can have uh, uh, control over all objects and bed simultaneously. So that, that's really nice. So I think this is an excellent plugin if you're working with Dolby Atmos, certainly something that I would recommend putting into your toolbox. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about has to do with Novo Labs 3DX. And that is a plugin that I reviewed uh, not that long ago. And I was really excited about the capabilities. But the one thing that I was really missing, um, and if you, if for those of you who haven't seen that video, once again, link in the description below, uh, it is essentially a panning plugin, a, um, a fully immersive, for, for, for immersive and spatial audio. And uh, it is very flexible. So it allows you to really pan every uh, channel configuration into every other channel configuration. And the one thing that was missing to me was, the fact that you couldn't really use it as a panda in Nuendo and Cubase. Um, and uh, Novo Labs actually reached out to me and uh, we got into a discussion and they actually implemented that. That's actually one of the things that I think probably the most important thing that happened to me this year that actually somebody did. That because what it really did, it, it created a solution that is really outstandingly useful in this in the context of uh, creating Dolby Atmos in uh, or any immersive audio really in uh, in uh, Cubase or end or Nuendo. So let's see how that works. Now, um, what I'm going to do is instead of uh, using the standard panner to to pen the helper track that that keeps the bed channels into the uh, the actual Atmos bed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Novo Labs 3DX instead. And the way to do that is very very simple. You just right click here, and you can now select the 3DX channel panner. How cool is that? So uh, let's let's select that. Um, and uh, what's going to happen is, first of all, it comes up with the standard settings. So you need to, it doesn't really automatically recognize the channel count that it sits on, or at least it doesn't kind of take any use of that. So what we first have to do is you need to kind of change that. So the signal that we have here, that the incoming signal is a 7.1 channel count. And what we're going to do is we're going to send that out to a 7.1.2. And you can already see how flexible that suddenly becomes because what we can do now is we can, for example, change the way this is panned into the system. So we can, for example, it can, we can rotate it, we can pitch it around a little, we can roll it around a little. And we are really flexible in the way we are going to position these eight channels in our three-dimensional environment. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of panning any higher channel count into any other tra other track with a higher channel count and that works actually increasingly well. We could even change the position. So for example, we could move the thing to the, to the right or the, to the left or kind of back and forth or kind of up and down and things like that. And that works um, extremely well. So let's just listen to how that sounds. Now, obviously we're not going to hear much of a difference because I don't have any head tracking, but it, 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 it just works beautifully and uh, that makes this an exceptionally useful planning solution. So if you're working with anything in immersive audio and if you're particularly working on Cubase and or Nuendo, then uh, this for me personally has become a, an absolute must have. This, this, is, this is just an ex excellent plugin that does everything that uh, Nuendo should be able to do internally but can't. It allows you to pan uh, multi-channel audio into any other multi-channel audio and you can do that just as you would do with any other panner in Nuendo and or Cubase. 
this brings me to the third point I wanted to make today, and that had to do with the way essentially uh, the output or the uh, ADM export worked. And if you remember, some time ago, I did a couple of videos where I compared the internal and external renderer, and I ran into an issue, and that was essentially turned out to be a bug in Nuendo. The bug essentially was that if I changed the size of an object but didn't put it into an automation lane, uh, the ADM uh, export would actually not export that, uh, that that size of that object. It would instead um, kind of fold it back into um, a point source and that essentially gave the wrong impression. And I've been informed that since then, Nuendo has actually changed that and kind of um, got rid of that bug. So let's just see if that's actually true. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the object size in one of those uh, objects. So let's just uh, change that here, for example. So let's have a little bit of a, a larger size. And um, so if you now play that, we should actually see that object having a bigger size here in the renderer. So let's see if we actually kind of export it or if Noendo actually exports that at that point. So let's uh, go into the project, into the ADM authoring for Dolby Atmos. And let's, uh, let's just close it. We don't need the external, the internal render anymore. And let's just export the ADM file. And I'm going to put that onto the, let, let's just keep it uh, untitled. That's fine. Let's just save that. It's going to process that. So let's open up the external render and see if we actually get the, um, Correct object size. Uh, so here we have Dolby, Dolby Renderer, and let's open up the Dolby Atmos Renderer. And here we are. And let's open up our master file. So let's open master file. And the one that we're going to open up is here untitled. And let's open that. And here we are. And then let's see if we actually hear or if we see the object size. So let's pray. And indeed we do. So we can see that it's now exporting the object size correctly. So uh, that bug that we that I ran into in my initial videos uh, is no longer there. They actually fixed it. I was told they fixed it in uh, in one of the recent releases of Noendo, and everything is now working as expected. That's really great. The last thing I wanted to talk about is with respect to a video that I did a while back. A video that not a lot of people have actually seen, but uh, those who have seen it, actually many of them reached out to me and uh, I kind of had very emotional responses. And that was the video that I did about hearing loss in particular kind of outlining that, uh, you know, kind of if you have a certain level of hearing loss, uh, you shouldn't worry too much about it, quite frankly, because the um, you can still work in the audio industry, you can still work with audio, you just need to be aware about all the limitations and you need to work around those limitations. So what I wanted to kind of just share with you today a little bit is how I actually deal with the fact that I have an imbalance in my hearing. So my, my right ear actually hears slightly different to my left ear. And the way I actually found that out is through a uh, an, audi, an audi audiometry. So I actually went through the audiologist and... Uh, uh, you probably can't see that here, but essentially what they found is that I have what they call a cookie cutter hearing loss. And that essentially means that I have a slight dip in the mid range in my right ear. So the right ear actually is naturally V shaped <laughs> and the left ear is not. So the left ear is relatively normal. The right ear has a slight V shape. And that explained a lot to me because one of the things that I found over the years is that I always have issues with certain headphones. And I now know that if a headphone is actually emphasizing the mid range, then this imbalance that I have in my ears actually becomes very, very noticeable. And it suddenly feels like the headphone is imbalanced. But in reality, it's my ears that are imbalanced. So what I decided to do this year is I decided to create a setting where I could actually kind of counter that imbalance in my setup. And I just wanted to briefly show you how I did that and what software I used actually to do that. Now, I am using that on a Mac. If you're on Windows, you would have to do something that is uh, a little bit different or kind of the, you would have to do the same things in a slightly different way. But essentially what I did is I uh, used a software that is called SoundSource and I'm going to use, I'm going to put a link in the description below. But what that really allows you to do is it allows you to add plugins uh, into the workflow so that uh, any audio that passes through the output is actually is, is processed through those particular plugins. Now, I use that for sound ID reference. I use that for the uh, Sl Stephen Slate VSX plugin. And I also have the can opener here. But the one thing that I wanted to show is that I also use that to counter any imbalance that I have in my ears. And for that particular purpose, 
what I did is I put at the very end of this plugin chain a ProQ uh, instance. And this ProQ instance just kind of changes the uh, the sound a little. So uh, for my right ear, I'm going to emphasize the uh, the mid range a little, and the left ear actually kind of in order to counter that, I kind of kind of went it down a little. And the way I really did is that I started with my uh, report that I got from the audiologist, and then uh, essentially just kind of started with an initial guess on how these uh, EQ curves should look like, and then I just did a regular frequency sweep and kind of uh, got to the point where everything sounded relatively natural. Now, if you want me to show how exactly I did that and how I achieved these EQ curves and how I did the frequency sweep uh, in order to get the balance uh, in a way that actually is as close to um, correct as possible, let me know in the comment section and I can certainly do a video about that. But the one thing I wanted to kind of really point out is that if you have certain hearing issues and um, I cannot stress enough that this is very common, it's just that people don't talk about it but it is very naive to believe that in the audio industry people who are working their entire life with audio uh, and sound will not eventually also have the same issues like everybody else and get get essentially certain problems with the hearing this is very common it's just not something people talk about now it has become a little bit more common to talk about these things in recent years rick beato recently kind of talked about his uh, tinnitus uh, i I, th I think it's getting better but uh, i just wanted to reiterate everybody who is struggling with this um this is normal <laughs> a lot of people have that and there are ways to kind of counter that and there are ways to work with that and that's really everything i wanted to say today and with that being said happy new year and see you next year i guess uh, which is already next week so let's see you next week